And I'll introduce uh, my dear friend and my Dharma sister, Lisa Gakyoshewi, who is a brilliant artist and a longtime Zen practitioner and one of our senior students at Eon Zen Center. And she's going to talk to us about art and Zen tonight, I believe. I hope. All yours, Gakyo. Thank you. My name is Gakyo, and I have an art practice. My teacher asked me to give a talk about art and Zen. So tonight I'm going to share a little about this practice, its role in my training and in my life. I'd like to start by offering a little historical context. So please bear with me for a few minutes of lecture time. The role of art and Zen is different from other Buddhist sects and other religions. Religious art is most often created with the intention of inspiring devotion and worship. It tends to be representational and idealized way and made from a place of great reverence. Think of Michelangelo's frescoes in the Sistine Chapel, the luminous gold paintings of saints in the Greek icons, Chagall's stained glass windows of Bible scenes, or the deities depicted in Tibetan Tonga paintings. In contrast, Zen art tends to be rough, spontaneous, and often irreverent. Originally created by monks who have to some extent transcended their egos, it's nevertheless an expression of their personal character and is their individual expression of the Dharma. Zenga or Zen art is an artifact of the artists encountering the present moment. The intention is to distill the essence of the Zen experience into a brushstroke on paper. D.T. Suzuki said the arts of Zen are not intended for utilitarian purposes or for purely aesthetic enjoyment, but are meant to train the mind, indeed to bring it in contact with ultimate reality. Zen art as part of Zen training goes back more than a thousand years. Ancient Chinese Zen masters used painting as a teaching tool, using a brushstroke to describe something words could not explain. A brushstroke could be used to show a teacher the student's state of mind. As Zen gained popularity and influence in Japan from the 13 to 1500s, the aesthetic of Zen art became standardized. And instead of Zen monks expressing their understanding through art, Patronage was given to professional artists and secular painters emerged and decorative takes on Zen art gained prominence. By the 1600s in the Edo period, the popularity of Zen began to wane due to significant cultural, philosophical and political shifts. Though at this time, to protect the culture, the Shogun decreed that every Japanese citizen needed to register with a Buddhist temple. Authentic Zen practice and its influence on the population's spiritual life gradually declined. A benefit of this was since they were now relieved of the ruling class's patronage, Zen masters were able to restore some of the older traditions in their temples and return to their own work with brush and ink, which included creating visual sermons for their students. The art of Zen is communication through brush and ink. The style of art changed drastically around this time, and it took on the bold simplicity and immediacy that we now associate with Zen art. Consider the ever popular Enso, a simple circle painted with one brush stroke in a single breath. It can be seen as the sun, the moon, as everything, the void, or enlightenment itself. The meaning's not fixed, finite, or static. Instead, it becomes a form of activity that continues through space and time. The monk artist only starts a process by painting that's reactivated by the viewer, and the viewer has a vital role in completing the work in their spirit. So Zenga embodies the actual experience rather than just merely the influence of Zen. 18th century Zen master Hakuin 
spoke of how the arts reveal the elusive aspects of the human spirit. We say someone has wondrous ability to play the zither or lute, but if we ask where that art resides, not even the wisest man can answer. The art, produced by something we cannot fully know, is the innate nature of the mind that operates in all our daily activities. So my first teacher, um, Daido Lori Roshi, said, what is being offered in the powerful and profound teaching of the Zen arts is simply a process of discovery and transformation. If we can appreciate the process and are willing to engage it, we will find before us a way to return to our inherent perfection, to the intrinsic wisdom of our lives. And that's no small thing. Before Zen Mountain Monastery was established as a monastery, it operated as a Zen art center. Art practice and creative process has always been thoroughly woven into the fabric of training on Tremper Mountain. During their two three month long ango periods each year, every student participating was required to engage in some form of art practice. There'd be a theme or a text assigned at the beginning of each intensive practice period. And in addition to the academic study sessions, dokusan, talks, and session, we would all engage in some form of art practice, writing, composing music, choreographing dance, working with clay, drawing. It, it was integral to our training. Creative arts and creative process were considered upaya, skillful means, and a way to see into the true nature of ourselves. It was not a replacement for zazen, but a practice we engaged in as students to complement our hours on the cushion. Like liturgy, it's a way to make the invisible visible. In his book, The Zen of Creativity, Dido wrote, creative process is like a spiritual journey. It's intuitive, nonlinear, and experiential. It points us to our essential nature, and it's a reflection of the boundless creativity of the universe. My introduction to art as practice happened before I formally became a Zen student, before I sat my first session. I attended a workshop at the monastery led by Kaz Tanahashi. He's a renowned artist, activist, teacher, and Dogen scholar. And the retreat was called Healing in the Brush or something like that. At the time, my boyfriend Tommy was in his 11th month of treatment for leukemia. And in all that time, he had a total of two weeks away from the hospital. And after countless tests and transfusions and radiation treatments, and very recently a bone marrow transplant, he was finally released to go home on the Friday my workshop began. So I was gonna be joining him afterwards on Sunday afternoon. So I entered this retreat with my mind pretty preoccupied. Art had always been a native language and I was confident in my abilities with the brush, but I had no idea where it fit in with the perplexing Dharma talks that I had been hearing or how it related with those first torturous periods of Zazen that I was barely enduring. I was drawn to Zen and this place and practice without really knowing what it was or why, but it seemed attending this program that maybe some of that would get worked out. On the first night, in a creaky metal bunk bed in a room full of strangers, I lay awake thinking, maybe I could offer my art practice as a form of prayer. If I stayed focused and did not allow myself to indulge distractions the way I did in the Zendo, if I really threw my attention into each brushstroke wholeheartedly, maybe Tommy would be okay. Then there were questions, how, how can a brush heal? What does healing actually mean? And is it different than recovering or curing? In the morning, short on sleep, stiff from the first block of sitting and full of oatmeal, I made my way up the hill to the retreat cabin. 
There we turned ourselves over to the ink, brushes, and paper. And under Kaz's careful guidance, all the hope that I'd be good at this, the thoughts of what others would think of me, the fear I'd do things wrong, and the questions lingering from the night before, quietly just dropped away. <laughs> in a matter that hadn't begun to happen for me yet in the Zendo. My self-consciousness dissipated. I was barely aware of the other people in the room. I was not thinking about cancer, Tommy, or the possibility of life without him. There was just ink, brush, and paper, the sound of the occasional bird outside, or voices from afar carried over by the song, soft April breeze. It was just this moment. Afterwards, I drove to Tommy's place, trying to find ways for what happened during the retreat. He coughed a couple of times during the dinner. We crawled into bed before it was dark. And when he called his doctor in the morning, describing the congestion in his lungs, he was told he needed to come back to the hospital immediately. We drove down the throughway to the city. I dropped him off in front of Sloan Kettering. And it was the last time I saw him before he slipped into unconsciousness and died. The name Daidoshi gave me when I received the precepts is Gakio. The Ga is the art from Zenga, and Kyo means mirror. This name didn't knock me off my feet. Um, in that lineage, the teacher chooses your Dharma name and offers it as a teaching, a kind of koan for you to sit with and learn from. I was hoping for something that sounded mysterious or deep or fierce, maybe. Gakia was kind of, uh, yeah, I get it. It's an art name. I do art. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Um, I remained pretty ambivalent about it for years until I, until what I've come to think of is the really bad year. Um, Dido died. The person who brought the Dharma to life for me and who established and maintained the only trustworthy environment I'd known was gone. Ten, min ten months later, my father died. And that complicated relationship, it turned out, was no better resolved in death than life. A therapy client I had worked with the previous year was found a week after he'd hung himself. And a few days later, another died of an accidental overdose. Finally, another client who had transferred to an outpatient program and stopped coming in to see his current therapist, went off his medications, uh, didn't return calls when we tried to reach him. And he ended up taking the life of someone else before ending his own. I'm pretty dedicated. I'm very loyal to the people I work with and I can be remarkably stubborn. I tried to stay on course and keep going, but I couldn't, I, I was fried. My judgment was impaired more than I realized. And because of that, I ended up losing a job I loved. So in less than a year, my entire, intent, my entire identity disintegrated. I was no longer anybody's student. I was nobody's daughter. I was nobody's therapist and I was barely hanging on as anyone's wife. I became untethered from all familiar points of reference. Distortions were washing over me like tidal waves and I was drowning in myself. Luckily, someone threw me a life preserver. A friend insisted I came to his studio and paint. And I did. And I went in and I basically stayed there for the next two years. The studio became my zendo. It was my dojo, my asylum, and my sanctuary. This became a terrifying and relentless practice of inquiry. I poured everything I'd seen, done, heard, doubted, and believed into this practice and allowed it to stream through all my pores out into the brush 
and onto sheet after sheet of paper I would tape to the wooden board resting on my easel. And in this way, I painted my way out of the pull of the undertow. I had a well-established sitting practice before, and now I had really a fully integrated art practice. And when I could stand again and started to look around, I saw how all those attributes that formed my previous seemingly solid identity were just roles, ideas, and constructs. It dawned on me that by giving me the name Gakio, my teacher had laid out stepping stones that I could have followed at any time to be able to see this. It just took the circumstances it took for me to walk that path. But the pointing was there all along and I'm so grateful to have this as my path. These days, making art continues to be as much a part of my Dharma practice as Azen. Before I begin work, I open an altar lighting candles and incense. I bow to my materials I'm about to work with in the same way I bow to my seat before sitting. In doing so, my intention is to free myself from fixed notions of what is about to happen, fully surrendering to the potential of whatever might arise in the next moment. It's how I lose the edges that separate me from the rest of the universe. It's how I empty, how I receive, how I know eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. I get to be the witness and observe with each brush stroke and with every cell in my body, the creation of the universe. And because I'm holding the breath, the brush, I'm also co-creating it, mutually arising with it. In the Plum Blossom fascicle of Master Dogen Shobogenzo, he wrote, when you paint spring, do not paint willows, plums, peaches, or apricots, but just paint spring. To paint willows, plums, peaches, and apricots is to paint willows, plums, peaches, or apricots. It's not yet painting spring. When a great master paints spring with his sharp pointed brush, he does not use any other power, but lets plum blossoms activate spring. He lets spring enter into the painting and into a tree, and this is a skillful means. In a talk about this koan, Daido Roshi said this, painter, brush, canvas, image, subject, they're not many. The painter is the brush, the image is the painter, the subject is the object, the canvas is the paint. Those things only separate themselves when we separate them by the way we use our minds. Whether you're speaking of a painting, Mu, a tree, the Buddha, or a plum branch, how you see it, how you relate to it, has to do with how you live your life with the question of life and death itself. So tonight, I'm gonna to invite all of you to paint spring or grief or the scent of incense. Become the diffused light of the hazy moon, the sound of rain on the roof. Please pick up a brush or a camera or a guitar or a pen. Take a breath make a mark, show up right here, right now. <laughs> 